economic war room, we talk quite a bit about the China threat. I heard a whole new angle on this recently. I was in Washington and was approached by an American medical writer who came up to me at a conference and said, hey, you're the economic warfare guy. I have a form of economic warfare that you may never have heard of. And she was right. When I checked her out, I realized this is very serious. And it's absolutely essential that we understand it both from an economic standpoint, but also from our personal health. Let's welcome into the economic war room, Rosemary Gibson. Rosemary, you came up to me at a conference and you said, here's a brand new form of economic warfare. And you told me I needed to understand it. And then you got me a copy of your book. Would you tell me what that type of warfare is and why we should be so concerned about it? The United States is dramatically dependent on China for so many of our medicines. Antibiotics, chemotherapies, and so many other essential medicines. And this is an untold story. It's an economic issue, a public health disaster waiting to happen, and a profound national security issue. Rosemary, why hasn't the mainstream media picked this up? Uh, this is an untold story because they're very powerful forces that don't want the public to know. If we look at the major networks, their uh, advertisements are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. The industry has done a lot of good for this country, but this is not a story that they want uh, the public to know. And also, China has uh, implicitly um, censored the U.S. media. It doesn't want to have bad stories about it come into the, um, the public mind. So they're off the radar. And so these are reasons that we aren't seeing this story out there in the mainstream media. And it's not a Democrat issue. It's not a Republican issue. This is an issue for all of us. But uh, we're not giving up, and we're optimistic, and we've been very heartened by the response to this book from industry, from the public, from policymakers. And we're, we're heartened that this is probably the best time we've ever had to begin to fix this problem with the tools that we have uh, in public policy. Well, the Trump administration has brought a big highlight to the Chinese lobby that's happening in Washington and all the things they're pushing for. Do you think this is an issue of Chinese lobbyists influencing us to keep us? It's from certainly very powerful, but one of the biggest uh, lobby groups is the pharma industry that wants to preserve its ability to do business in China for as long as it can. And as we say in China RX, there's a chapter called the uh, China Trap. And it's just a matter of time before those uh, companies will realize that they're putting money into R&D, but how long will China let those companies recoup a return on their investment? Look at Apple. It has the most innovative product in a generation, the iPhone. It's been on the market 11 years. In China, it has only about a 7% market share of all the smartphones. Google initially went into China, and it was very short-lived. Its source code, it's the heartbeat of its business, its key intellectual property was stolen, and it left after four years. It has zero percent of the market compared to the Chinese uh, domestic search engine. So this is there's a this is not for the long term for the industry, and I think think that they realize that. But for right now, there's a huge demand for their products in China among Chinese consumers, who their incomes are going up, their expectations are going up, and they don't trust Chinese medicines. So they're looking to Western companies who are more than happy. And of course, we want to ensure that people in China have access to good medicines. But how well is it going to work for these companies in the long term? There is a China trap. No doubt. Rosemary, you've uh, had a long history of writing in the medical field, and you've won awards on this. What about the China RX story first intrigued you? What made you interested in learning more about this uh, dangerous security risk? It was remarkable that there's been this huge shift in where our medicines are being made, and nobody knows. So here are, the, here are the generic drugs that are being made in China that millions of Americans are taking, and they don't know it. Antibiotics, antidepressants, medicines for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, 
high blood pressure medicine. Young women are shocked when I tell them that their birth control pills might be made in China. And the list goes on and on. And that's ramping up quickly. It's just a matter of time before China overtakes India in the production of generic drugs. So what was so surprising is that the story has been untold. And it's an honor to be able to tell it. Well, you open your book with a story about heparin, and you describe how the drug thinner heparin is something that we basically have lost control of. Can you tell us about that? Uh, sure. This, there's a commonly used medicine in hospitals and kidney dialysis centers, and it's called heparin, and it's a blood thinner. And 10 years ago, suddenly there were cases popping up of people getting sick. And it turns out that this was a deliberately contaminated drug that got into the legal supply chain in this country. It was deliberately contaminated for economic reasons in China. And up to 250 deaths were reported to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And that's probably an underestimate because a bad drug is very hard to trace to show cause and effect. So the number of injuries and deaths from this is probably much, much higher. Well, isn't heparin necessary for all surgeries? And aren't there people who have clotting problems that need heparin? Uh, heparin, hep, heparin is ubiquitous. And the United States is dependent on China for more than half of the raw material. It comes from pigs and from the intestines of pigs. You need one pig for every vial of this medicine. And it turns out China has the world's largest supply of pigs. But if there is a disease outbreak, as there was, there was a shortage. And so enterprising minds put in a fake substitute. It turned out to be lethal. They weren't trying to kill people. They were just trying to cut corners. Is that right? Make a lot of money. The real product cost about $600 for a pound versus $6 for the fake ones. So it was economically motivated contamination. I thought we manufactured critical drugs like heparin here in the United States. Isn't that true? In the United States, we're making more of the finished drugs, particularly brand name drugs. But for products that have been on the market for a long time, like generics, a lot of that manufacturing has been outsourced. And China is the dominant producer, not only of the key ingredients, Kevin, but also the chemical building blocks we need to make them, those critical components. And we're so dependent that if China shut the door within months, the pharmacy shelves and the nearby corner drug stores would be empty and hospitals would cease to function. That's how dependent we are in this country on China. How could we let this happen? Doesn't the FDA require that key critical drugs are manufactured here in our own country? Oh, there's no requirement at all. In fact, we document in the book, it was a, a, really a surprise to make the connection between our trade policy and our supply of medicines. We documented that in 2000, we had the opening up free trade with China. And within just four years, that's when we lost the last aspirin manufacturing plant in the U.S., the key ingredient. It's when we lost the last penicillin fermentation plant in this country. We can't even make penicillin anymore. What happened is Chinese companies formed a cartel. They dumped the product on the global market at below market prices. We've all seen this playbook. It's the steel playbook. And then all the other producers were driven out in the United States, Europe, and even India. And then the prices went back up. So we can't make penicillin. On page 33 in your book, you say, in the 1990s, the U.S., Europe, and Japan manufactured 90% of the global supply of key ingredients for the world's medicines and vitamins. Now China is the largest global supplier. There's been a dramatic shift, yes, dramatic shift from the United States, Europe, and Japan. And China, through its industrial policy, has very smartly for, for the Chinese people and the Chinese economy, has targeted pharmaceuticals as an area for growth. They have a lot of talented chemists, and so they've taken on this industry. And it's just a matter of time. We're migrating from the components to now United States here. Millions of Americans are taking generic drugs made in China by Chinese companies 
and don't know it. And China Rx is the first book to name those generic drugs being made in China by Chinese companies and prescribed and used here in this country. Well, later in the book, you contrast the FDA inspection of plants from China versus the FDA inspection of plants in the United States. Would you tell us about that? Sure. It's an unlevel playing field for manufacturers here and manufacturers in China. One of the biggest differences is that the FDA is required when it goes into a plant in another country, usually it just can't walk in. It has to give advance notice to the manufacturer and also to the government. And that's four to six weeks advance notice. Whereas here in the United States, the FDA can walk in on Monday morning and spend a week or two inspecting a plant. That's very different. In the four to six weeks when companies have notice, there's a lot that they can do to clean up things before the FDA comes. So that does create an unlevel playing field. How often do FDA inspections happen here versus how often they happen overseas? Uh, for many years, the FDA inspected Western plants much more than they did plants in China. In fact, it was quite shocking to see back in the 90s we uncovered an FDA memo written by a very dedicated public servant who said, we have no idea where these drugs are coming from, these key components, and they could get to the president. So for many, about 20 years, we had a strongly deregulated environment. But after people died from this contaminated blood thinner that we talked about, um, finally Congress and the White House got together and there were stronger inspection standards and also resources and authority for the FDA to go more frequently into, FD, into ch plants in China. But again, those inspections are just not the same. Moreover, China has withheld visas. They've made it really hard for the FDA to do its job on behalf of the American public. They've withheld visas for FDA employees that were stationed by the FDA in China, at least intended to be there, but they held those up for several years even though the United States is buying millions and millions of dollars of drug products from that country. Why would we ship our manufacturing of critical drugs to China? Is it the money? Company is trying to save the money? Or is it access to markets? What, what is it? What's going on here? It's both of those uh, things, Kevin. First, manufacturers went there, and we, we traced it back to the generic drug law back in 1984, which made generics drugs possible for the American public. It's been a boon to consumers that don't have to spend as much money when they can get a generic versus a brand name product. But it turns out one of the unintended consequences is if you're going to sell a product that's cheaper, you've got to figure out a cheaper way to make it. And so we began to see the migration of manufacturing of mostly the chemical components, the key ingredients, over to China, again in a deregulated environment. But the other reason, as you say now, the uh, trade deals uh, with China, it certainly has created incentives for companies to move to China. We've seen billions and billions of dollars investments, not only in manufacturing, but also in R&D in China by brand name companies that Americans would know. And they're required to do that if they want to access the growing market in China and the appetite for the brand name drugs that we here in this country take for granted. So China imposed those conditions on U.S. and European companies. If you want to do business in China, you got to manufacture here, you got to invest here, and you also have to support our research and development. Are we seeing the same kind of forced technology transfers and intellectual property theft with the pharmaceutical industry as we do in other more traditional forms of manufacturing and high technology? Is it different? or the Absolutely. And what really changed uh, our trajectory in this book was the realization, this was after attending a hearing on Capitol Hill, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, riveting testimony by a company that had been requested by 20 different industries to go in and take a look at some anomalies that they were seeing in the global market. And this company documented what these sectors had seen, which are cyber, very sophisticated cyber economic campaigns against these 20 industrial sectors. And the aim of the Chinese government is to disrupt, to dominate, 
and eventually displace U.S. and other Western companies. And the pharmaceutical industry is one of these high-tech sectors. And what you're seeing is it's not just a loss of common manufacturing jobs. It appears like we're losing a, a important industry and a lot of very high-wage, high-paying jobs, like you wrote about in your book. We documented during a period of time at least 60,000 chemists, very talented people, lost their jobs in the industry. These are high-paying STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, mathematics positions. And as companies are investing in R&D in China and elsewhere, there was a large U.S.-based company that wanted to move its antibiotic research functions over to China. Think of that. We need next-generation antibiotics. And this company was considering moving its research over to China. It's unclear where that ended up, but that certainly caused a kerfuffle. This is important intellectual property. We need to view our medicines as a strategic asset. This is a national security issue. Even the U.S. military is dependent on China for the medicines for the young men and women in the South China Sea. Just imagine if there is an altercation or the trade routes are blocked. The young men and women on those naval vessels may be dependent on the adversary for uh, key components in the medicines that they take. After the anthrax attacks in 2001, the U.S. government needed to buy huge amounts of antibiotics. And it turned to a European company. And I interviewed the CEO of that company, a good company, and he said he got the starting material at a plant in China. So just think of that. We had a dramatic public health national security event in this country, and the United States was dependent on China for the essential ingredient to make the treatment. So what you're saying is our need for drugs makes China a perfect economic weapon to use against us. Our medicines can be used as a strategic weapon. And if we look over history, food has been used as a weapon of war in World War I and World War II and be earlier. Our medicines can be used as a strategic weapon. China doesn't have to hack the electric grid. It doesn't have to go to all that trouble. All it needs to do is either withhold or degrade important medicines. Already, the FDA went into a plant in China based on customer complaints. These are complaints from companies buying product. And some of the complaints were about these products are not fully potent. They don't have all of the ingredient that they should have. And we're talking about antibiotics and chemotherapy drugs. And so you could, China could be selling us medicines, and we won't know until it's too late that some of them don't, are not what they should be, that they don't contain the full active ingredient and have the therapeutic value. That's a very, very challenging national security issue that we face. Well, you document in the book, it's not just prescription medicines, but you mentioned supplements. For example, you talk about vitamin C. Sure, this is a classic case of economic war. Uh, the, it started out very seemingly simple, but as evidence came forward, we saw that China created a cartel for something as simple as vitamin C, ascorbic acid, the key ingredient. There were a group of Chinese companies that got together. They made large quantities of ascorbic acid, vitamin C, put it on the global market at below market prices, and they drove out uh, U.S. producers. And they gained a dominant market share, and then they increased the price 700 percent. What's different here, though, is that the this went to a federal court. The evidence was very clear. A jury in Brooklyn said, yes, this is a cartel, a violation of U.S. antitrust, and the Chinese companies were slapped with a very large fine. But then the companies appealed with the help of the Chinese government. And this is where it gets interesting. The companies and the government said, well, we required our companies to form a cartel. We required them to control prices and to set controls on export volume. Think of that. And so we cannot expect our companies to abide by Chinese law at the same time that they have to abide by U.S. law. And a federal court of appeals in New York agreed with that argument. 
and said in the interest of international comity, neighborliness, we can't expect those companies to abide by both sets of laws. And so that lower court decision was overturned. At that point, think of it, it effectively legitimized cartel-type behavior among Chinese firms for virtually anything that they sell to the United States. If that's not a case of economic warfare, I don't know what is. The good news is that the company, U.S.-based companies appealed this decision to the Supreme Court, and during the current administration, the Department of Justice, which, by the way, was totally absent in, this, in the prior cases, the Supreme Court said the Federal Appeals Court put too much attention on and too much leverage on what the Chinese government said, and it probably shouldn't do that. So it sent the case back to the U.S. Court of Appeals for review. But this is the real case of economic warfare, when cartels are formed to drive out important businesses. And if they can do it with vitamin C, they can do it with brand name drugs and other essential medicines. Well, it's not just prescription drugs and not just vitamin C, but it's aspirin also, isn't it? That's right. The last aspirin manufacturing plant closed in about 2002 when Chinese companies came in and dumped it on the U.S. market and it drove out the last plant. So uh, this is the playbook. And what, I, what we really have to be concerned about is that we are at risk of losing an entire industry. China's ramping up quickly to make a lot of the generic drugs, the ones off patent. And meanwhile, we know that it's stealing the intellectual property for the new ones. So what's left? We have to decide as a country whether we consider this industry a vital industry. And if so, we need to take steps to protect it for generations to come. Well, a couple of other things. Uh, do we inspect the ships to see what drugs are there? Uh, do we test the potency on the cargo ships, the container ships? Do we look at the drugs? Does the FDA show up, look at the drugs, and determine if they are what they say they are and how potent they are? Do we look at that? The FDA does some limited testing of products based on risk. And that's typically precipitated during an inspection of, in this case, a Chinese facility. There are some limited FDA inspectors at ports, but the job is so huge and there are so few inspectors. It's a challenge. What we have here is this globalization of the supply chain has been a form of de facto deregulation. And so the American public, we've been used to very high standards for generations. When I was growing up, you never thought for a second that there might be a problem with a medicine. But now, we have to think about it. Most recently, there was a, a case of a blood pressure medicine widely used in this country called Valsartan. And it was found to contain yet another contaminant. It's almost like the heparin story. In this case, it was a carcinogen that shouldn't be there and it was taken off the market, but only after four years, after it was discovered and reported. And there were thousands and thousands of people, including those insured under the military program TRICARE, that were taking this. And so it raises serious questions about our ability to monitor and ensure the safety of medicines in such a complex world, in such a complex global supply chain. Do we at least put on the label that it was made in China? Or how does someone in the hospital or a doctor know if a medicine was made in China? How can we tell? The labeling is virtually non-existent. Most companies do not put that information on their label. There was proposed legislation to require country of origin labeling about 10 years ago, but it was resoundingly defeated immediately and when I asked an industry person how that happened and why, this person replied, well, it's likely because the industry doesn't want the public to know where its medicines are coming from because it wouldn't be good for business. So it's very hard to find this information. That said, we have some tips in China Rx on where consumers and physicians and pharmacists can begin to find out where their medicines are made.
Well, in the economic war room, we always offer our viewers a battle plan. How do you address this problem? And what I love about your book is you don't bring just a problem, but you also bring a solution. In fact, chapter 14 is a 10-step plan to bring it home. And you go through 10 steps of things we can do. Could you tell us a few of those? Uh, sure. The first step is we need to think about our medicines as a strategic asset and not just a cheap commodity. Remember years ago, some pharmacies were giving away antibiotic prescriptions for three or four bucks. We have to think about why it's so cheap, and we all want cheap, but we have to think about the high price of cheap. And as a nation, we need to think of our medicines as a strategic asset, like we do oil, like we do food commodities. We would never allow this to happen with our energy supplies, nor would we allow it to happen with our food commodities. So that's job number one. Let's consider our medicines a strategic asset for our country. And a strategic asset is something that the country would fall apart if we didn't have it. The second thing we need to do in treating it as a strategic asset, we need a tracking and forecasting system that documents global supply and global demand of the key components and ingredients for essential medicines. We need to do risk assessments, country and supplier risk assessments, to identify gaps in the system where we could have problems with supply in the future. There are some active ingredients for really important antibiotics that we can only get from China. There's an antibiotic of last resort to treat life-threatening infe infections where the key components come from China. So we need a tracking and forecasting system to identify these vulnerabilities. The third thing we need to do is to provide some in strategically targeted incentives for domestic manufacturing of high priority products, especially for federal procurement by the Department of Defense, Department of Health and Human Services, and Homeland Security. Those are some of the measures that we need to take to preserve and protect supply of these important products and to ensure that we have a manufacturing capability, that we, there are still people that know how to make our medicines. You know, we don't have penicillin fermentation plants in this country. We don't want to lose the workforce that still has the skills remaining to be able to do that for our country, for our public health, and for our national security. Well, those are some great steps that we as a society can do. We also try and tell our viewers in a battle plan what they personally can do. And you've got an appendix here, how to find where your medicines are made. Could we get your permission to reprint your action steps and your appendix in our battle plan? Absolutely, you have my permission. And what consumers and listeners can do is uh, go online. There's a couple of websites that we identify where you can look for the box that your medicine comes in you might just get that orange plastic container with the white tops that are hard to open so you don't see any information whatsoever about the manufacturer. You can go online and type in your name of your product that you're taking and then sometimes you'll see on the box the manufacturer, where it was made. You can also, when you go to a drugstore to pick up a prescription, ask the pharmacist to show you the box it came in and take a picture of it with your phone. And then if you're still having trouble finding it, call up the company. And there are some companies that are more than willing to tell you where it was made and where the ingredients were made. Other companies don't do that. But any good company, it seems, would be very proud of where their medicines are being made and would be happy to tell their customers. Well, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take your story to the national security arena. We're going to tell our contacts in the Pentagon and in Congress, this is an important economic warfare story and we need to address it. And we're going to ask every one of our viewers to read this book. So thank you, Rosemary. Thank you for being a part of the Economic War Room. Thank you. This is Kevin Freeman from the Economic War Room.